Um, I would like to also acknowledge that there are a few people, the traditional owners of this area. Um, I pay my respects and average respects to their, their elders and their uh, leaders, past, present, and future, and thank them for their important contribution to our culturally rich nation. Um, I, um, I, I want to thank Mary Ann too for, for setting this all up. Um, it's certainly exciting to be talking with the Northern Institute um, at a more deeper level about how we can all approach and collaborate um, to, to improve the situation of animal management in remote communities. And thank you all for taking time out of your schedules as well to attend. I really appreciate the, um, the attention. So, um, often when I'm presenting about how I'm presenting on the East Coast um, to conferences there where people there probably don't have any concept of remote Indigenous communities. And so, um, I hope that I'm not going to be making you suck eggs. I'm going to try to, to pull back on my um, delivering information about the context because I'm sure that many of you have far more experience in remote communities than I do. Um, but please forgive me if I, if I do make you feel like you're sucking eggs a bit. Um, and you'll also note um, throughout the discussion that there's um, not much mention of cats. Um, you know, dogs have traditionally been the, 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 the companion animal in remote communities in, in the last a few, few decades, certainly, um, but we're increasingly seeing more and more cat populations, and I think um, this is going to be a, a big area that's going to require a lot of focus as well. So, while there's not much information directly, and there's certainly not many pictures of cats in my presentation, um, certainly the principles do apply as well. Um, so, how many of you are dog owners? Hands up. Quite a few. Uh, not surprising, considering you've taken the time to come and, and listen to this talk. Kevin? Couple, couple, yeah. So, I mean, Australia is a pet owning nation. 62% of Australian households do have a pet of some form, um, and that works out to be about two in five households with dogs, three in ten with cats. So, we love animals, and certainly for those of us with pets, the value of those animals to us is, is clear. They enrich our lives, they're part of our family, um, they help us deal with our stresses, they encourage us to be more physically active, and they help to teach our children responsibility as well. Of course, in remote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, uh, the value of dogs and increasingly cats is also appreciated. Like you and I, many remote community members own dogs and, and cats as companions. Uh, and that's particularly true, I think, for the elderly and the very young, the socially isolated, or I mean, even those with few material means. You know, animals are a real lifeline um, when we're struggling. You know, they, they really provide that support. Um, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, certain dogs, um, so far dogs, I haven't heard any stories of cats, but it may, may be the case, we'll see, uh, have been in, incorporated into kinship systems, so they've been given skin names and they've been granted status of grandparent or aunt or child, however that positions them into that, that particular clan's kinship system. Um, and, and that means that the management of those animals has um, certain uh, an overlay of cultural consideration as well. You know, we, we really need to carefully consider how we deal with people uh, who do own dogs with a skin name and what sort of responsibilities that, that imparts on us as animal management uh, service providers. <coughs> um, some dogs are used as hunting aids, and we'll often get told that, oh, this one's a good goanna dog, or this one's a good kangaroo dog. And certainly strategic and intentional breeding of those dogs does occur. Um, and so again, you know, we, we need to be careful about which dogs we go out and do sex because a lot of people want to keep this particular dog and breed from them for their hunting abilities. Um, and of course, while cats may not make a very effective hunting assistant, they in themselves are very good hunters and they're often now kept to keep snakes or rats at bay. Um, and of, of course, this may be desirable for the household. Uh, however, for the broader environmental impacts, um, that's quite a concern. Uh, less common up here in the top end, but certainly in desert communities, there's still two, three, four dog nights where dogs are kept as a source of warmth, where there might not be enough bedding to go around or sufficient quality of the bedding anyway. And, and dogs particularly are also kept as a, a source of protection. You know, evil spirits are still well recognised in many remote communities and dogs' ability to hear and see things which we cannot um, make them quite revered. Beyond these assumptions, of course, for some clan groups, dogs are an important part of culture and they're incorporated into dreaming knowledge. 
Clearly, of course, being the, the uh, creation of the stories of creation and the origin of the lands and the peoples. And some fan groups believe that ancestral dogs created uh, their lands and they can identify dog breeding sites across their country. Ceremonies that are based on the dingo and dog are still practiced today in many of these communities. And some individual community members will also be holders of dog dreaming in their, in their own communities. And so if we want to be implementing animal management programs, we will need to go and consult with those particular people as they have the responsibility for the law around dogs. So it's clear that companion animals are valued in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, but they're so often cited as a concern. You know, anyone who's been to a remote community can talk to you about, oh, those free-ranging dogs, those cheeky dogs, what a pain they are, um, and how much more complicated they can make life. And there's certainly a complex interplay of issues that um, have led to this, which we'll explore, but I think it's valuable to also reflect on the history of animal ownership in remote communities, in that, um, of course, cats are, are quite a new phenomenon, um, and we'll put them aside, but, but dogs, well, traditionally, they were, they were dingoes, not dogs. And dingoes are quite distinct from the domestic dog. Dingoes breed once a year, not twice. Um, and it's generally quite a strong pack structure where the, the, the hierarchical, uh, the dominant female is, is usually the only one to successfully breed a litter. And the litters are generally smaller than domestic dogs as well. Um, so when communities then embrace domestic dogs as they were introduced to Australia, it meant that the management that was fine for dingoes was no longer adequate for domestic dogs. And hence, um, a lot of the population issues that we see around domestic dogs um, ha have evolved because it's just, a, it, you know, people weren't used to having to manage dingoes. And so why would you think that a dog would need the same sort of, a, a higher level of management rather? Um, of course, overpopulation is, is the prime example where dogs uh, and, and companion animals are unmanaged and where there's entire dogs and bitches or even toms and queens and they're free roaming, of course they're going to be breeding um, and breeding frequently and this will lead to large numbers of puppies and kittens being born and therefore a number of unwanted animals. This results in a huge range of really negative welfare outcomes for the animal population, um, particularly as the community's capacity to care for each of those individual animals diminishes because they've only got limited resources and they can't accommodate an ever-expanding population. Um, certainly, there's some environmental uh, factors that come into play to maintain those populations at, at a level where they can match the community's resources and things like parvo disease is, is a huge one of those. Um, but it's, it's um, it, you know, it's something that, it, it, that affects the community members beyond the fact of there that being too many physical animals in the community as well. It really mentally impacts those community members. And the, the helplessness and stress experienced by community members who are in a situation when they can't stop their animals from breeding. We've really summed up in this quote, I think, um, that a woman at Manning Breeder was just so frustrated and so helpless at the fact that she couldn't access the services to prevent her dogs from breeding. Um, I, I should note, though, that despite there being large numbers of dogs in remote communities and that they be free roaming, it's very rare to find an unowned dog. Um, they may appear to be unowned from a visitor's perspective, um, but 99.9% probably of the dogs in communities are known to the owners by name. They may not have the same sense of ownership as we in Western society would have ownership over our animals, but they are certainly, there's some sense of responsibility there. And so to go in and manage uh, animals without consulting or con uh, 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 communicating with the community members themselves is going to be fraught with difficulty. Um, so parasites are a huge issue in remote communities um, and that's basically because the people in these communities lack the access to effective prophylactic treatments. You know, obviously if our dogs were coming in ticks like this, we'd be going down to the vet or down to the local pet store or rural supplier and purchasing a product that would treat these ticks. But when you live in a remote community and the store doesn't stock product or if it does stock product, it's difficult to use and you've got to dilute it and you don't have the right equipment to be able to do that, how on earth do you manage burdens like this? And, and clearly, this isn't just a problem for the animal, this then becomes a problem for you as well. You know, these ticks are, in this sort of quantity are going to be crawling up your walls in your house, they're going to be getting into your kid's hair, it's going to be a major issue. Um, and, and certainly for anyone 
uh, animal or human who's immunocompromised, these sort of issues are really just, um, the, the, the problems are just enormous. Um, intestinal worms are also a major issue, and, and again, particularly the young animals are, are very um, susceptible to these sort of issues. In urban areas where we have access to regular worming or treatments, we just don't see conditions like this or, or, or burdens like this. In a community where there's a lack of access to veterinary services, there are going to be animal welfare issues. Animals inevitably get injured, um, and if there's not a service there to deal with those injuries, then you're going to have welfare as a consideration. And, and this little guy was just really lucky that the vets were in, in the community at the time that he had his obviously his very severely infected joint. He was able to have his leg amputated and probably went on to live a very happy life. Uh, but not all dogs are that lucky. Um, and then to add to that, we have conditions like canine transmissible venereal tumour. So this, this is a contagious cancer. Um, you might have heard of Tasmanian devil facial tumour. They're very similar. They're quite uh, similarly similar in their genetics. And it's a contagious cancer that's trans sexually transmitted. So where you have lots of breeding occurring in dogs and you have vet services that aren't accessing those communities often, we often see quite severe cases of CTVTs like this one. Uh, it is treatable, but again, to treat them requires often consistent treatments, and when the vet service is only visiting maybe twice a year, often euthanasia is the kindest option for these, these sort of cases. Um, and, and just as animal cruelty occurs in, uh, in non-Indigenous settings, it also occurs in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Sometimes it's intentional, sometimes uh, it's just down to a, a lack of knowledge about appropriate animal welfare. Um, but drawing a line on animal welfare in remote Indigenous communities is, is really challenging. So zoonoses are infectious diseases which can pass between animals and humans. Um, and historically they've been a bit of a controversial issue in remote Indigenous community animal management. Um, there's, there is some data about um, the linkages and certainly there's evidence to demonstrate that a number of, of different parasites like Sarcoptic mange pictured here can be transferred from animals to people, uh, but there's ongoing debate about the significance of uh, the, the, the scale of that problem, I guess. You know, is it really occurring at a quantity sufficient to direct resources to it? Um, but for those of you who are interested in, in, in the science behind it all, I'd really encourage you to have a read of a uh, paper by Felicity Smout. Uh, it was published last year. She went through and reviewed all of the peer-reviewed evidence on canine zoonoses in remote Aboriginal communities. It's very worthwhile reading, and in it she highlights the known zoonoses as well as the gaps where we need to do some more work. Um, for those of you who don't know much about it, um, scabies is a mite, so it's a parasite, an external parasite. And there are a number of different subspecies of scabies, and there's human forms, there's dog forms, and there are other forms as well. Um, Scabies is a huge problem in the human population, and so there's a lot of work going into eliminating uh, scabies in, in, in people. Um, but scabies does occur in dogs as well, and the dog form can transiently affect people. So people, if you're picking up a, a mangy puppy, for instance, you often get some skin irritation afterwards, and that's a result of those mites transferring from the puppy and burrowing into your skin. And um, when you're having that sort of irritation regularly and when you're living in environments where the environment isn't ideal, often they, they become secondarily affected and that can lead to consequences then uh, over time where we start to see things like uh, rheumatic heart disease and chronic kidney issues. Um, so while, while these things might not seem that significant, in the long term and particularly when you're living in such close association with your animals as happens in overcrowded remote Indigenous communities, then I think that it is significant. <coughs> um, fortunately though, canine scabies is very easy to treat and these are those same three dogs after a, a few doses of fortnightly ivermectin. Um, so I mean ivermectin is administered orally, it's very cheap, it's easy to administer, but, but even now we have even better products that can eliminate scabies in one dose. Now we have very effective products that are easy to administer um, they're not terribly difficult to access, particularly for us in, in more uh, accessible regions, but we can make, we can get these products out to communities. Um, and so, I mean, clearly, the, the, for the dogs, the difference is clear. But the treating conditions like this also has such a big impact on the families that are living with these dogs. You know, to, to have your dog transform from, I don't know if I can go backward, but the, the, the scaly 
trusted, you know, who wants to be patting that dog? I don't. Um, to, to a dog with a normal coat that's looking healthy, it, it just makes such a remarkable transition for that family. Post management, it's a big problem in remote communities, let alone with the added complication of dogs going around upturning bins and scavenging for scraps and leaving their feces everywhere. Um, it's certainly a health risk, it's not pleasant for the people who are having to deal with it. Um, and not, not even pleasant for the people who have to witness it. And of course with large dog populations comes a high degree of nuisance. And you can see in this photo, you know, there's this massive dog park going on. The dogs are agitated, the people are agitated. And this sort of occurrence, maybe not to the same scale, but th these sort of um, scraps are regular in communities and they add to the heightened level of stress of remote communities as well. Um, and, and it's not only during the daytime, I mean, certainly the time that I've spent in remote communities that I've been working through the night by dogs barking and howling and fighting and mating, everyone who's been there can attest to it. And so I really feel for people living in this situation constantly, who are trying to participate in the workforce, who are trying to go to school where their sleep is constantly being interrupted um, by strapping dogs. Uh, and in any community where there are free-going dogs, the risk of dog attack is greatly increased. And this is a video on my phone. Um, the risk of dog attack is greatly increased, and just as in urban locations, aggressive dogs do occur in remote communities. However, um, with the free roaming nature of dogs in remote communities, I actually think that dogs are generally far better socialised in remote communities than they are in in the, the Darwin suburbs, for instance. Um, and usually cheeky dogs in communities are either so before they've been teased or provoked or potentially trained to be guard dogs. You know, it's, it's not common for a dog to just have that nature. Um, nevertheless, dog bites are common in remote communities and they're certainly a human health concern. Um, they can result in severe and significant physical and emotional injury. Um, and even death. In fact, times there have been cases where dog packs have mauled people to death. And of course, beyond that, that, that huge activity, there's also the, just the impact on your daily life. You know, you don't want to go for a run in these communities because you know you're, going to, you're having to fend off the dogs as they're following you. And, and um, so your ability to live a healthy lifestyle is diminished as well. So, I'm sure that you can appreciate that the problems caused by um, limited animal management are problems not just for the animals, but problems for people as well. And I, I want to talk about um, K-18 and the cycle of intolerance here because I think it really encapsulates the, the spiraling issues that we're dealing with. Um, basically, you know, we've got these problems that are being caused by companion animals and this leads to people's attitudes being changed by those animals. So the, the people start to perceive the animals um, with an intolerance and uh, they, they don't welcome those animals anymore because of all the problems that they're causing. This of course can lead to an ambivalence or cruelty to animals and the more people that are displaying this intolerance, this ambivalence, this cruelty, it just begins to snowball and that in itself leads to an effective lack of effective animal management because people don't want to invest in something that they don't see as valuable, in fact in something they see as a problem. You know, why would we direct resources to this thing that's just so frustrating? Um, and, and so the cycle can continue. But it's not only the uh, problems directly for the animals and the people that, that, that add to that a layer of mental health um, burden as well. So the problems caused by dogs cause this constant frustration and annoyance. You know, every second day, if not every day, there's some little issue with the dog that just oh, sets you off in a community. Um, or conversely, you might be sad and ashamed by the state of the dogs in your community, particularly if you're a dog lover and you can't access those, those services you need to keep those animals healthy. There's also the issue of fear, so fear of attack or fear of health risks. So, you know, fear of your kids getting scabies from those, those major dogs. This can often lead to disgorge um, and tension between neighbours. If you've got a dog loving neighbour and someone who's so dog loving and the dog loving neighbor is having to witness the other person potentially being cruel to the animals or implementing some sort of inhumane treatment then it's going to lead to some tension within the community and this again it can snowball into trauma and anger and even there's some studies to suggest it can lead to inhibited empathy development you know if you've got um, 
kids particularly witnessing a, a level of animal abuse on a regular uh, frequency, then certainly their, their empathy with those animals is going to be reduced. Um, I want to talk to you, we will talk about lack of effective management, but first, I want to talk to you about Oliver. So Oliver is from Manigrida, and I think that his story just really encapsulates um, the cycle of intolerance at a personal level. So um, last February, in fact, Oliver approached the Manigrida store manager, Jane, um, because Oliver was basically at breaking point. You see, this was Oliver's dog. His dog had been progressively losing condition, his skin obviously deteriorating. Uh, it was evident to everyone, Oliver included, that his dog needed help. But there's no regular vet services within that community. There's no local animal management capacity. So what does Oliver do? He really turned to Jake, the store manager, in desperation. And in fact, he was in tears when he approached Jake. Jake and he said, look, I love my dog. He's a loyal companion. He's, he's sweet natured and he's, he's great with my kids, but the community members are cruel to my dog because they're, they're scared of what he looks like. They don't know if they're going to catch diseases from him. They, they throw rocks at him and try to kick him. And it's breaking my heart having to witness this constant cruelty to my beloved pet. Fortunately, Jake's store manager had been trained by one of the visiting vets to administer off-label ivermectin, and he had some there, and so he was able to treat all of his dog. So he started treating him on a fortnightly basis, and after only a few treatments, perhaps a couple of months, this is what Oliver's dog um, returned to. You know, a, a remarkable transition, and certainly there's still a way to go. You can see he's still got a bit of hair loss around his muzzle, but what a, what a remarkable improvement compared to where he had been. And <coughs> it's not only the health and welfare of his dog that's improved, it's the attitudes towards his dog as well. So people no longer threw rocks at his dog. People didn't try and um, throw hot water to get him away from them because they, they weren't scared of him anymore. They didn't think they didn't consider him to be a health risk. So you can see how that cycle of intolerance, you know, this is just one story, but there are many like this in remote communities. You can see how that cycle of intolerance really just churns and churns and churns away. Um, and, and that's really where we need to bring in and, and improve effective animal management, both um, by vets visiting these communities, but importantly and critically, building the local back capacity of the local communities as well. Um, so I've been thinking about this quite a lot lately and trying to think of the key ingredients for remote community animal management to make it effective and sustainable. And beyond the remote setting, even in urban areas, we can think about animal management and how it's delivered. And, and really it comes down to three things. So access to animal health care and services. So you and I, we have our pets, we take them to the vet, it's a short drive, we can get them on the phone, we can get advice. That access is easy for us. But not only that, we can also go to the supermarket and we can buy food for our pet that's appropriate for our pet, that's at an affordable price. Um, we can also um, go to the pet store and get a toy for our dog if we want a toy, or we can buy um, some flea shampoo. You know, we have access to those sort of services, where in a remote community that's often lacking. The second critical aspect of it is local government authorities that are resourced and equipped to implement animal management programs. Um, so, for instance, Darwin City Council has an animal management program. They have animal management ranges, they have bylaws, they have a pound. They've got all these supporting structures that mean that um, animal management can be dealt with when it needs to. And there's, there's an education approach, there's a compliance approach, and there's an enforcement approach to that. But they have the resources they've also got a decent ratepayer base to be able to fund that. Um, and certainly uh, having that local uh, government with responsibility for that is important to ensure that companion animals are effectively managed. But we also need a societal culture that supports that. So, um, you know, a, a culture where people do adhere to bylaws, they appreciate and understand that they're there for a purpose um, and that they're willing to uh, uh, adhere to them. And that they also understand what responsible pet ownership is about and that they're able to do that for their dogs and, and their cats as well. So when we think then about remote communities, well, what's absent? So in terms of access to animal health care and services, quite a lot. You know, AMRIC has done a lot of work um, to improve access to remote, 
veterinary access to remote communities and there are wonderful vets both affiliated with Mamrec and otherwise who've also done the same work and it's really I think it's been going on since probably the 80s and slowly building, slowly building and we are now seeing communities where there is effective veterinary service access and that's really encouraging you know 20, 30 years ago that was the bulk of, of the work and there was a lot of work to be done in that space but things are improving and people now often um, and, and broadly do recognise that access to veterinary services is critical there's still a way to go, but on the whole, we are moving towards a culture where that, that is um, deemed as necessary. What we need to improve on then is the access to the products in the store, um, the access to advice when we need it. Um, you know, having the vets visit two or three times a year is wonderful, but there needs to be that local level management capacity to be able to support uh, people who are trying to take responsibility so that um, they're not just left in that helpless situation. Local government's resource to implement animal management plans and programs. Well, um, it really varies. So um, if we take the Northern Territory as an example, and we talk about the remote regional councils here, there are nine regional councils that Amory works uh, quite closely with, and two of them have vets employed full-time on staff one or multiple, which is amazing, you know, that was unheard of even 10 years ago. And the, the improvements that they're seeing because of that are just astounding. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, we still have regional councils who aren't able to resource animal management and who don't have the staff to be able to develop or implement programs. And so um, working with these regional councils to build their capacity so that they do have the skills and the knowledge internally to be able to live at appropriate animal management program is really critical. And, it, it, you know, I'm not saying that regional councils have to be at the point where they've got bylaws and they're enforcing them and we're at a level, say, comparable with Darwin. Because certainly the remote regional councils uh, of the NT, none of them have bylaws in regards to animal management currently. Um, but just to have a, a, a local animal management worker who is able to provide that, that local support to the community um, is, is really critical. Support of societal culture. I think um, there's, a, there's always going to be work to be done in this space, but it's really encouraging to see what is happening in communities. You know, people do recognise that pet ownership um, does have obligations that go, that go alongside it, and there's great education work being done by Fabric and other organisations in this space as well. And, you know, you see these people who absolutely willingly spend their limited budgets on animal uh, products when they can get access to them. It's not that there's a lack of desire there. Um, it's, and, and the more people that we can provide access to, again, it's just going to be a snowball as well, but in the opposite way. We're going to see more and more responsibility and that society that is supportive of responsible pet ownership. So the benefits, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear to me and I'm sure that you will um, appreciate all of these as well. Obviously, we have improved animal health and welfare. You know, you're treating the conditions of those animals and their health and welfare improves. The, the stabies, the major dogs are a clear example of that. But as we discussed, there's also the improved uh, human health and welfare benefits as well, uh, both physically from a, a zoonotic disease perspective, but also mentally and socially. We've got improved immunity and safety. You know, when there's effective animal management programs and animals are responsibly cared for, the ability to walk down the street improves. The risk of being attacked by a dog as you're riding your bicycle reduces. Um, so certainly um, that's an important aspect of it as well. Reduce negative impacts on wildlife and ecosystems. And again, bringing it back to cats, this is a particularly um, important one. Um, cats are so independent and able to survive so well on their own that it's really important that we do focus on managing them well. Um, but even dogs, you know, when there's too many dogs overflowing from a the population, they're contributing to um, the wild dog situation. They're impacting on both the wildlife and the ecosystems, but also the economic activities of the pastoralists and the, um, the, the various people who utilise that land as well. We've had a lot of discussions lately about reducing the biosecurity risks. You know, if you've got huge populations of dogs, particularly in the coastline communities of Australia, you've got rabies, it's only 300 kilometres away in Bali, there's a significant risk there that if rabies does come to Australia and it gets into a remote community, 
we won't know for a good time because um, those animals may not be effectively managed. We, we need to be able to have that local capacity to be able to tell us, hey, these dogs aren't right, I'm raising a flag here, you need to come and investigate it. Um, and that can only come with that local management capacity as well. And of course, enhanced empathy development. Um, critical in these communities that have experienced so much trauma um, and violence and, and all the things um, that have happened that, that the animals are there as a positive thing in their lives, not as a negative. Um, so what, what is Amrit's role in this whole space? Where do we fit in? Well, um, we've been all in existence for about 14 years. Um, we were initially started by vets and environmental health practitioners who were out on the ground delivering this work. And they uh, were all going and doing it independently and realised that there was great benefit to be gained by coming together and sharing knowledge. Um, and so uh, Amrit actually started life as the Big Lick back in 1999 and then we rebranded to Amrit, which is, is of course animal management in rural and remote indigenous communities. Um, and, and really the pioneers of that work were uh, an environmental health worker, Phil, Phil Dr Donoghue, maybe some of you came across his, his work. Um, he was a great champion for the cause, unfortunately he has passed away now. Um, but also people like Tony English and of course Stephen Carter and you know, the guys who've been out on the ground and around for so many years, they've got such incredible experience to offer in this space. Um, we work nationally, we uh, are One Health focused organisation, so um, we really try to <coughs> work to support the linkages between animal and human health. You know, it's, this isn't just about animals and animal welfare, it's much broader than that. And, and I hope that um, you guys have an appreciation of that, certainly from your own experiences, but what we've been discussing today as well. Um, we tend to work at the moment in the NT predominantly because that's where our federal government funding comes from, but we do have relationships across the, the country, particularly. Queensland, and West Australia, South Australia, basically where remote communities exist. Um, we have some real keys to our approach and I think that this is what has resulted in our strong relationships and the maintenance of those relationships over time. So we really understand and appreciate the value of animals uh, to the people and we respect that and we, we won't do anything unless we have their informed consent and that's really critical. Um, we aim to work with all stakeholders and embrace all stakeholders to develop culturally appropriate and tailored solutions to each community's needs. Because each community will have different needs, they'll each have a different capacity, different resources. Um, so it's important to, to work to that, that, that capacity, but also work with all the other people who are trying to work in that same space and have similar goals as well. Um, and of course, we, we, in any work in remote Indigenous communities, it's about building trust and taking time to build relationships. And so that's what we do. We try to implement solutions slowly, allowing people to see the benefits themselves personally and be willing and eager to participate because they recognise those benefits. So we need to be a resource. You know, we want to work with local governments and we do work with local governments and their animal management staff across the country. We are a resource for veterinary service providers and for stakeholders who are interested in or impacted by animal management. But above all, of course, it's for the communities. You know, this work um, is working with communities on their requests and, and only doing so where we're invited, but working with all these others so that we can benefit them. <clears throat> so when we work with local government authorities, you know, the, the staff turnover in regional councils is so enormous. Um, and animal management is quite a, a niche subject area. There, there's specialised skill in that role, and it can be really difficult for regional councils to attract skilled and knowledgeable staff to that area. Um, and, and oftentimes, uh, with the, the turnover, we get staff that come in and are, are really enthusiastic and excited, and they want to push all these programs, which um, they're able to come to us, and we, we with our long-term view, are able to tell them well, actually. That was attended here four years ago and it didn't work for these reasons, so why don't we work together to go down this path instead? So we work, we, we effectively were a bit of a corporate knowledge bank for a lot of the regional councils and we assist their staff um, to develop and design appropriate programs that meet their community's needs. Um, we help in, and we help them by advocating for increased resources. You know, being a regional, a remote regional council is tough. They don't have a good ratepayer base. They've got plenty of services to deliver across wide, wide areas. So um, 
it's understandable then that they don't always have the funds to be able to support animal management. So we try um, to work with them and highlight where the resource gaps are and then identify ways that we can advocate for more funding for that. Uh, we also connect them with veterinary service providers. You know, that, again, it's what do you do when you're an animal management from over uh, in a remote council and you've just been placed in this role? You look up the other pages to find the vet. You know, by connecting them with people who are experienced, who um, have the right community engagement approach, we're able to better their outcomes. And we also help them out with uh, lots of resources. So we, our education officer is always developing educational materials and resources and working with regional councils to deliver those messages to better, res better promote responsible pet ownership. We work with veterinary service providers. You know, we've started by veterinary service providers. That's really our foundation. Um, but generally, veterinary service providers, particularly the experienced ones, are pretty, um, they're great. You know, the, the, the community engagement standards, their quality of service delivery is amazing. And the, the conditions that they work in are tough. So we really appreciate what they do, and we try to help them wherever we can, in any way that we can. Um, we are often setting up relationships with um, experience and inexperienced vets who are coming into the space. So we set up mentor-mentee type relationships. Uh, we our has a volunteer program, so we have lots of interested people, mostly on the East Coast, vets and vet nurses and otherwise, who are keen to uh, volunteer their skills and add capacity to programs. So we're able to offer them to our, uh, our veterinary partners as well. And of course, um, when they're in community, being able to work with a local contact, a local liaison, is so beneficial. Having someone there who speaks a language, who knows the local politics, who knows the cultural protocols, who can say, no, that dog doesn't live at that house, he lives over here, is really, really extremely beneficial. So we encourage them, uh, our veterinary service partners, to work with those local liaisons, and often we work to identify those appropriate people from the communities for them to do so. And of course, there's a whole range of other stakeholders working in this space. There's the likes of the Northern Australian Quarantine Strategy, who are focused on biosecurity. Uh, there's Marianne and Telehealth. And there's a whole lot of linkages that can come in and really um, add mutual benefits to the animal management space. And so we try to work with, with any stakeholders who are willing to listen, basically. We, we, we link them up, um, particularly researchers with communities or um, organisations with veterinary service providers, there's a lot of that catalyzing relationships that goes on within AMRIC. Um, we, we try to promote evidence-informed decision-making, so we, we are, are regularly reviewing the data that's available and presenting that back to our, um, our partners and the policy makers and decision-makers about who are funding animal management as well. Um, and of course, we, we Ultimately, we're, we're all working towards that same goal of promoting that responsible pet ownership, and we just are all each approaching it in slightly different ways. So, by coming together and discussing our progress and sharing how, it, how our approach is, we're able to find those niches, we're able to um, really explode the results. That's not the word I'm looking for. Yes, yeah, synergies, all those buzzwords, that's right. <laughs> and of course, as I said before, it's all about assisting this community. So, we're working with the communities to develop programs that meet their needs, um, you know, that for the woman in that breeder who's requesting the, the, that, her, uh, her, that her dog be sex because she just can't handle the puppies, for Oliver in Manning breeder whose dog is mangy, um, and for the communities across the country that are requesting these services. And it's not that, that the request isn't there, it's just a matter of um, finding the, the right people and the right resources to make it happen for those communities. There's plenty of opportunities in this space, um, and, and AMREC is certainly, we do our best to explore them. I should preface that with the note that we are a staff of 3.8, um, so we are quite limited in our capacity, but we do try and do what we can. Um, and certainly, I think critical to um, long-term policy change is demonstrating more linkages in this One Health realm. So demonstrating that animal and human health is impacted by each other, um, and that it's um, it's beyond the physical, it's the mental, it's the social, all those things that we've already talked about. Animal management capacity locally is such a bugbear for AMRIC. You know, other states have got their act together, and they do have local animal management capacity, and we've tried in the Northern Territory with a pilot, 
uh, but we need to do much more. That there's a huge deficit of uh, skills and knowledge in our management capacity on the ground, and we really would like to do more work to see um, this change at a policy level so that it is better supported. Legislative requirements, you know, um, legislation is a bit, a bit tricky in remote communities and there's always going to be a bit of a, a reluctance to engage with authority, but ultimately there's no responsibility for animal management in the Northern Territory. Local regional councils aren't, aren't, aren't mandated to deliver animal management and if local regional councils aren't, then who is? Um, so really there needs to be a, a a multi-pronged approach to responsible pet ownership, and part of that is legislation. Um, and, and of course, we can't just imp we can't just put legislation into place without the concurrent resources to support the delivery of that legislation as well. And as we continue to chip away at it, it's becoming easier, I think, over time as people do acknowledge um, their relationships with animals and and um, how the health and welfare of the animals impacts upon them, but increasing that empathy and increasing that sense of responsible pet ownership so that communities themselves um, are really driving these decisions. In collaboration, we've had lots of meetings today at the Northern Institute and um, this is, these are the exact type of discussions that we need to continue to have just to explore those synergies and make sure that um, those of us who are working on these sort of projects are not replicating effort. Um, but instead being mutually beneficial. Um, this is a photo from an education program that Courtney, our education officer, recently delivered at Rabbit Guinea. And Courtney's been working with the Rabbit Guinea community for about two years now. And um, she delivered uh, in this particular visit a dog health festival. And the support from the community was just amazing. Um, Courtney's worked so hard to build relationships in that community and her efforts were clearly evident in the success of this program and um, the community loved it. There was, it was a week-long um, series of events. Um, there were dog collar coits, there was um, a day of hydrobathing and then everyone brought their dog down and courts for families to bath their dogs. Um, she had school, school lessons about our needs and responsible pet ownership and empathy. And um, uh, of course, a big community there, barbecue, all, all the standard sort of community engagement stuff in remote communities. But um, it's clear in these communities where we are able to work over a period of time and build those relationships that people love it, that, that they love their dogs. There's no denying that. There's no questioning their understanding of responsible animal ownership. Um, so, if we can work to improve their access to things like veterinary services, to animal health products, um, and to those supportive and visible structures like bylaws and all that sort of legislation stuff, then, then really the sky's the limit in terms of their engagement with animal management. Um, and I just wanted to finish, a few years ago we ran a program called the Animal Management Worker Program, which um, saw local community members employed as animal management workers in three regional councils across the territory. And at the end of that program, there was a formal evaluation conducted and, and our evaluator went in and had interviews with the AMWs and just some of their quotes, they're, you know, they're five years old now probably, but they're still so relevant. Um, and it really just depicts how everyone knows about it. Uh, it's just a matter that we just need to get it through policy as well. So um, this one from one of our, our AMWs on group, being an AMW is important for dogs so they don't get sadies which they don't share with people, so it's important for people too. Aboriginal people have always looked after their dogs, but they're seeing there's more control of numbers if less puppies are being born. There's more food to go around as well and less problems with aggressive dogs. Kids are learning and washing their hands. I like being an AMW because it's a job where you can see results. For example, you go back to a community after, a month or so after you visited, you can tell which dogs have been treated. They do look fit and healthy. And ultimately that job is making the difference in closing the gap, improving the health of dogs and people. So it's certainly possible and for parts of it, it's very easy to do. Um, so we, we will certainly continue to work in this space, but we look forward
want to further collaborations with the Life and Northern Institute, see you and anyone else in this audience who might be interested, please let us know. Bachelor, I know down the back. Um, because it's it's clear the impact that animals do have on people in remote communities and the benefits that can be achieved when they're effectively managed. There's some further reading, um, and I'll highlight the snout article up here for those interested in the One Health Space. Um, but the rest of it is all very interesting as well. Um, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Feel free. Bonnie, can you, um, I did ask you, when I was at uh, Manangrida, Menu and I were at Manangrida a couple of weeks ago, we did have, like, there were six horses on my front veranda the first morning and then two fighting the next morning. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that Amrit do a lot of work with um, dogs and mm -hmm. now more with cats. Do you do other work with other um, animals and communities? Well, traditionally we haven't um, in that we haven't, we certainly haven't um, done specific service delivery with other animals. However, being in this space, we, we do have a lot of uh, relationships with people who are able to fulfil those sort of roles. Um, so we have facilitated discussions and even some uh, veterinary service activities about horses on, on places like Palm Island um, and some discussions in, this, in the desert regions as well. It's something um, that's generally more challenging. Um, horses, cattle, donkeys, they're very political um, and it can be very difficult to reach consensus about appropriate uh, appropriate ways to manage those animals. So it is um, it is challenged, um, but it's certainly something that Eric can provide advice into. Our funding is largely around companion animal management, but um, because we're in that space, we do have some input into it as well. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Hello? On a general one. Yeah. You've seen things improve over the years. Uh, well, I've been with that for five years, and I, I, even in that time, I would agree. Jan's been here uh, with that for 10 years. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, think some things have improved, some things have stagnated. So, um, just yesterday, I was actually reading a paper that was presented at one of the big lick conferences in 2000, um, where Tony English, is one of the pioneers, was talking. He, he was talking about the history of remote community animal management and the, the topics that still need to be addressed. And a lot of his recommendations for topics that still need more work are still are still relevant. There's still a lot of work to be done in a lot of those spaces. But in terms of acknowledging that. Access to veterinary services is essential. I think there's a lot of improvement in attitudes about that now. Um, I think that regional councils generally acknowledge that animal management is necessary. Whether or not they have the funding to deliver it, they can still appreciate that it, it is a, a necessary activity. Um, whereas perhaps 15, 20 years ago, it wasn't even, that's not for us to even talk about. So I, I think that attitudes are changing. There's still a long way to go. There's still certainly a lot of policy work to be done, particularly in the Northern Territory. Um, you look at models for local animal management capacity in Queensland and Western Australia, uh, and they're, they're decades ahead. Um, they've got local animal management capacity. Um, they've got the supporting structures to uh, ensure that those staff are trained and, and given the skills to stay in that role and be confident and comfortable to, to deliver their activities. So, um, yeah, the, the Northern Territory still has a lot of work to do, particularly in that regard. And, and it, I mean, associated with that, we don't, we don't have any companion animal legislation in the Northern Territory, but every other state and territory does. That there's a whole range of things that the Territory still needs to work on, but generally, yeah, I think that things are improving. I'm, I'm optimistic. 